energy is wealth. And if a woman doesn't have to carry a jug of water on her head two miles a day to feed her children because she can pump and clean water, life is a little different. And we are now spending trillions and trillions of dollars fighting these corrupt illegal wars that are totally unnecessary. And Michael and I have been working for a long time trying to figure out how to tell the story about what you could do with all that money. You know, they say, well, we can't f go and develop this form of alternative energy because it's too expensive. And we are going to, and they pull the price supports out under uh, wind power. And they support the oil companies. And when you support the oil companies and don't support wind or solar, you're not going to get anywhere. And so the reality is if we take the money we're spending on these wars and put it into health care, into education, into alternative energy, the whole world could be a beautiful place. And a beautiful uh, place. I'm still, I'm 65 years old, but I'm not giving up the dream that my parents had as old lefties that, you know, we can share this world, there's enough to go around, and uh, it's possible for the next generation of kids to not have to worry about the kind of things that we were given a golden spoon. At the end, we came, I was born in 46. We were the masters of the universe. We controlled Europe, we controlled Asia, we told everybody what to do. A guy made $157 a week. He worked in the steel mills. His wife didn't have to work. Good education, pension plan, health plan, house and a car, you know? Yeah. And that's a dream today. Andy, I'm uh, not going to give up the dream either. No, Andy. me either. And, uh, uh, one of the, th uh, you mentioned uh, sources of energy, and I just got to bring this up. I, you had me play a, a, a rogue CIA mean guy in a movie called... Chain uh, Reaction. Chain Reaction, and uh, Keanu Reeves was in that, as well as Morgan Freeman. And the premise in that movie is they have discovered a way to turn hi water into hydrogen. And I'm wondering is what, I know that pe people are working on it, what's the status of that, that uh, energy source? Well, hydrogen is still a viable energy source as a, a transporter of energy. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the energy that we waste every night when the, when the turbines are not being used, mm -hmm. the energy for the wind, the energy from the sun could be separated in hydrogen from water constantly. Yeah. There's a technology that I'm very interested in, which is a, sort of an orphan technology, which was shut down by Bechtel. Uh, and when they told Ronald Reagan, stop developing that stuff to the Department of Energy, it was called Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, OTEC. And OTEC, ba OTEC basically takes the thermal difference between the hot waters of the equator and the cold water below, just like a, a, a heat pump, and you have constant energy, and you can then use that energy to separate hydrogen, and that hydrogen could be brought to fuel cells, huge fuel cells all along the coast of the country to power the grid. And we can use hydrogen in cars. So. It's, it's, it's technology that it needs refining, it needs, needs energy, but if, if we took the trillions of dollars we spent on these last few wars and applied it to alternative energy, it would be really great. Really, really the really trillions great. of dollars could do a heck of a lot more than just, um, he's coming, um, a heck of a lot more than just the energy thing. There's room for everybody. We're shifting around up here while we talk on the radio. And, uh, we're now One bringing things, up Michael, Michael Gray. Michael Gray is coming up. Careful of the edge. Wonderful of Chicago oh. guy. Good morning to you, Michael. Hey, Mike, Mike Gray. James, how are you? I'm good. good to see you here at Michael, the Heartland. Tell us uh, what moved you to come back. You were the guy who shot lots of footage uh, back in 1968. Yeah. You made a wonderful documentary called American Revolution II. You did the murder of Fred Hampton. You went on to do the China Syndrome. You wrote that. Uh, and uh, I was real excited when I learned that you and ha uh, Haskell Wexler and Andy <laughs> and Gordon Quinn and a number yeah. of other people whose names I don't know were getting together to shoot footage now. And I was uh, a little disappointed that I have to go off to my daughter's graduation and also burying my mother's ashes. Uh, so I'm leaving it all in your hands, but tell us what, what moved you to come back. Well, we got involved in 68 just totally by accident. I was an upwardly mobile businessman that morning at 845, had Colonel Harlan Sanders in my studio on no. Grant Place, <laughs> shooting, uh, you know, uh, lines for Leo Burnett, finger licking good, and, <laughs> and we get a call from the art director down at... Uh, 
uh, <laughs> at uh, Leo Burnett that he's on the 27th floor of uh, the Prudential building and he's getting tear gassed and you know it's coming up from the park he said you won't believe what's going on down here he described the scene and uh, so we told our lovely uh, and alluring receptionist Brenda Beerbro oh remember? yes I take the colonel out for lunch and don't bring him back <laughs> <laughs> so, we went down there and, uh, and, and Brenda just, knew how to do that oh she <laughs> certainly did and, and the colonel of course was very interested I mean he you know, but uh, he was a delegate from the great state of Kentucky, a closet Republican who, of course, voted for Nixon, but he was a Democratic delegate. And um, so uh, Celeste, we just Kentucky wound up, chicken, I'll eat. we wound up at the corner of Michigan and Balboa, uh, Jim Dennett was our right. guiding Lit light, a wonderful, one of the best, yeah, one of the best filmmakers in the world and uh, he found us a perch there at the corner of Michigan Balboa where we managed to get this shot the one that everybody uses of the cops wading into the crowd there uh -huh. you know? and um, we shot 7,000 feet of 16 millimeter in the next 24 hours and uh, I can't do that anymore, Mike. But fortunately, the camera only weighs two pounds now. <laughs> but uh, it was, it was uh, you know, we started that morning as upwardly mobile businessmen. And by 8.30 that night, we were revolutionaries. That's you know, and it totally, I mean, it was a transformative experience for all of us. We just never, we finally got it. Police brutality, you know. I mean, all of a sudden, when it was focused on white people, Thank you. we had a clear understanding of what it means and yep. uh, so I, we we never uh, and it, it it's changed the whole objective of our existence so when this came up I said you know who knows what's going to happen but if anything happens I sure don't want to miss it <laughs> <laughs> and so Haskell and, and Andy and I were talking about this one day and said hey boys let's do this hey you boys know. yeah <laughs> you well hey boys, the old Chicago. the old farts film company is where but uh, <laughs> We can still run backwards, you know. Uh huh. So that's a good thing. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of the stuff, the nurses in particular yesterday, were tr very, very inspiring. Yes, and, and they are. Both Incredible. as union people and as human beings, it was really. Uh, Who better? Who better? I think we all should start wearing Robin Hood outfits. Yeah. I think <laughs> that uh, it should be a little something we could sell in the store <laughs> if we could. If we could all run around in our Robin Hood suits. Yeah, yeah. You can be Friar Tuck. <laughs> That's a good idea. Actually. If you're making a movie, I'll play any part. <laughs> um, you know, the, the footage that we all saw, um, I was 18 in 68. My line is um, a great year to be 18. Oh, um, but I also was uh, the daughter of a city worker, and as such, my father and mother went as guests of Mayor Daley to observe the uh, convention that night. And I was at home watching coverage on TV. I had spent days roaming through Grant Park listening to people like Bobby Seale and Eugene McCarthy. But I sat there, and as the footage continued and the carnage began, I saw footage that night that I never saw again um, of people getting their heads banged in. And my folks came home around the time that I was maybe three feet from the TV, so incredulous that I was. And they came home, and the it was a moment for us because it changed all of us. They went to the amphitheater, and on their seats were signs saying, we love Mayor Daley. <laughs> and that put them off. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I was in tears at what I saw happening in the streets and the three of us sat there and talked for a couple three hours yeah. about the world wasn't the way we thought it should be uh, right. as it turns out and uh, some guys who we thought were the good guys maybe aren't mm -hmm. um, our own guys yeah um, so you, the you, footage you know, is really important that what, you took what's really what's really sad is uh, there were so many young white kids out in those streets because of the draft yeah, and today, exactly. kids don't have jobs, and so kids go in the military because there's no alternative in terms of finding an education, having health care, just staying out of trouble. And so, 
these continuous wars that we fight and the trillions of dollars we're spending, it hasn't stopped. So is the world a better place? Yes, it's interesting. We, you know, we have a, a black mayor who comes from Chicago, a black uh, president who comes from Chicago. He'll he'll really make the grade when he's the mayor. Yeah, yeah. We did have a great black mayor, but <laughs> we he's, did. Harold he, Washington, yeah. long live. And 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 and, then, and and the thing is that uh, you know the world has gotten better. But as it gets better, it gets worse. It's that old yin-yang, that back and forth of this. Yeah. And so the, the point is that we now can talk to each other. The whole world can communicate with each other in this, this crazy media we have, which is both a blessing and a curse. Right. And the whole world is literally watching. Mm. Yeah. And I hope that the events of <laughs> Occupy and what's going to happen over the next few years, you know, it gets people from being demoralized about what's happening and activates people so they can really go out and be part of the change. You know, I, um, I was accused by uh, my Christian ethics professor at Lake Forest College in the early 60s of being a meliorist, which is someone who believes that things get better. And I'm working off of you saying the world is better. Uh, he said, not necessarily. I had written a paper on Gandhi, and I, you know, I, the last paragraph, but the people come together, it'll all work out, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he said, not necessarily, and pointed me in some directions of some things that didn't work out. And I'm, I think the world is better in many ways, but I also think there's probably more misery on the planet. And I'm reminded of a, a Grama article by Fidel Castro that I read on a plane heading to play baseball in Nicaragua, where he basically talked about misery in the hemisphere increasing in geometric proportions in terms of poverty and housing and opportunity. So it's, I don't think it's a done deal that things are better or will get better. I, I like to believe, I think that can keep us going, but we have to be aware that there is the other side of that. And it's up to the, you, me, the rest of us, people who care to really, what we say here on the show, do good in the world because the world sure needs all the good that we do. One of the things that uh, uh, Andy mentioned, the fact that we've been working on a, a documentary about the energy crisis and also now a feature film, hopefully, but uh, uh, the key to the whole problem, the misery index is always related to oil. To oil? Words, to oil. oil. All the countries that we've screwed over in Africa, you know, uh, and uh, in, in the Middle East, the upheaval, the chaos, the reason for World War I and World War II was control of oil. The, uh, we interviewed General Wesley Clark, who's a wonderful guy, former uh, head of uh, uh, the NATO, NATO forces in commander, commander in chief of NATO, and a very decent human being. And he's got the numbers in his head. When he was a captain in the Pentagon, he was asked to do a study, and he came back and said, if we don't get uh, off of oil onto alternative energy, this was in 1972, uh, we will be, a, we'll have to fight at least two major wars in the Middle East at a cost of two or three trillion dollars. Da -da 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 -da. And he goes right through the numbers. And the kid, the 17-year-old kid who was interviewing Alex him, Lures. Alex Lures, a spokesman for his generation, uh, he turns to Lures and he says, your assignment is to figure out how to stop the oil companies. And it's not going to be easy. It requires an institutional change because the oil companies together, Exxon and all the big guys, have $17 trillion in assets in the ground right now. And if you think you're going to talk them into backing off, you're crazy. You know, you've got, we've got to have an energy policy and we're not going to get it as long as the oil companies are buying the Senate, buying the Congress, buying the President. Thank you. Yeah, on both parties. Yeah. I mean, they've got enough money oh, yeah. to buy out everybody. Right. So, and as Andy said, the, uh, <laughs> we got the answer right now. You yeah. know, we could switch to wind, but there's enough wind power to run everything in the country, you know, and the guy who's uh, designing these huge machines gets the rug, as he said, gets the rug pulled out from under him every time he gets ready to save us. You know, they cancel his uh, subsidies and give them to the oil companies. So it's a nightmare. And solar isn't even, you know, it's not even a question. It's put solar panels on the roofs and problem solved. Get rid of the, you know, you can use the oil for cooking. You know, there's, there's a YouTube that I watched last week that Medea showed on Monday night of uh, her interrupting a meeting with Brennan. What was that meeting, Medea? Uh, at the Woodrow Wilson. 
Woodrow Wilson School uh, Center for Center for Study of Yeah, yeah, something. Something. Anyway, uh, Medea's routine and Code Pink for a while now has been to be where. Uh, it's appropriate to speak truth to power and she was in the middle of doing that and got dragged away If you could see the size of Medea and the size of the guy who dragged her away, you know it You'd be blown away But you what really struck me Medea was that you were so articulate and continued your rap yeah. Even as you were being dragged away not screeching just straight out saying you know We're here to represent the Afghan women the Afghan people the Pakistani people who are being and what she the story She told about this. Let me get to it is that that went viral, that video on YouTube, and the moving part for Medea, as she explained to us, was the response of people in Pakistan, not just seeing the video, but reading the comments that people wrote that, that touched them because they didn't know there were that many U.S. citizens who cared. People in other countries always How like about it, that, that? there are those here who do care and, and make a stand. We, we need to do so little, is what it always strikes me. Yeah, yeah. We need to do so little to move the world in a right place. Yeah. Well, on that note, yeah. I would like to thank you too for having this institution for all these years. <laughs> I want to thank bringing people like Medea Benjamin here and her bodyguard. Teakberry, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and really you've been a real institution in this community, and I, I, I shudder to think about you not being a part of it. Yeah. We're, well, we're still here. Uh, I'm going public. We are taking in a business partner, uh, but Katie and I are definitely going to be here. And, and we've uh, got three seconds. We've got a lot of work to do, and we've got to get out of here. No, we've got 30 seconds. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to Andy about was his wonderful film, Stony Island, that has been released, re-released. You can get it online. I play a nasty guy in there. We'll talk about that another time. Right. You guys are great. You've been always inspired me. Running the streets, brothers. <laughs> and we <laughs> encourage quickly. everyone listening in to check us out on YouTube.com slash Heartland Media and to continue to do good in the world because the, the world needs all, all the good, good that you do. Over all and out, all power to, to the, the people. people. I'm the power to the people. Listening to 88.7 WLUW Chicago Sound Alliance, broadcasting from the campus of Loyola University. Once again, it's gospel time with Bob Maverick.